right we're on so welcome everybody to genuine rock stars and today we will be interviewing our very first genuine rock star natalia jagielska welcome to our channel natalia hiya how are you doing thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today could you maybe tell our audience who you are and what you do okay so i'm a third year PhD pantologist. Uh, I'm doing a doctorate in Pteros evolution. Pterosaurs are those creatures over here. They're flying reptiles from Mesozoic. They're not dinosaurs. People like putting their same thing. They're very close to dinosaurs, but they're slightly different creatures. And my job is to study their evolution in Jurassic. It was a period of mass diversification. It's when uh, they became very diverse, much, much bigger, much more interesting than the uh, body forms they had in Triassic and Jurassic. So that's my work that I have been doing for the past three years. It passed very, very quickly. It doesn't feel that, like that much. Uh, and uh, recently I published a new paper which was describing this guy and a uh, big middle Jurassic pterosaur. So you hold a master's degree in earth sciences and you're now a PhD candidate in paleontology but you're also active as a digital artist and a science consultant, and you even finished a course on Mandarin and Chinese culture. So between all of your interests, what made you decide to pursue a PhD in paleontology? It was kind of random to be honest. I didn't know what a university was or who paleontologists were. Uh, when while I was searching for after graduation of high school opportunities, I just randomly picked various events uh, within Manchester, which was where I was from, uh, and I picked an uh, introduction course in Earth Sciences, and I just felt like, yeah, Earth Sciences, I do Geography, I'm not the biggest fans of Geography, but let's try it out, and uh, one of the lecturers on the series was uh, Phil Manning, who's a famous American pathologist, and he was talking about uh, chemical preservation in Archaeopteryx feathers, and I felt like, Oh, we are doing this kind of research locally. That's amazing. <laughs> and uh, because of that, I went to do geology because that was part of that cohort, uh, which had integrated masters in research in pathology. And after seeing that uh, advertisement about chemical traces in birds, I did masters on that in the same department. Uh, so yeah, it was purely accidental. So your latest paper on an unusually large Jurassic pterosaur from Scotland made the headlines. So first I have to ask, can you please pronounce the name and tell us what it means? Okay, so the name is from Scottish Gaelic, which is a language that's spoken quite a lot in uh, Hebrides and Sky, uh, and Yax Kianak. And I might be saying it incorrectly because I'm not a Gaelic speaker at all, uh, but it means winged reptile from Scottish Gaelic, and also it means reptile from Sky, because Isle of Sky, from which this guy comes from, uh, is called Winged Island. So it's double meaning. It's winged reptile and reptile from sky, <laughs> which is amazing. It's like two things, I think, and it's like as, as if sky was made uh, for discoveries of flying animals. Could you tell us what led to what led you to the specimen, which research you did on it, and and what the take home message of the study is? It's a very big question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, I came across the research because it, it was a bit price as a PhD. Like I said, I was not a professor expert up until starting the doctorate. So in the initial years, I was just studying anatomy from scratch and learning more about pterosaurs. Uh, and uh, this led me to describing this amazing specimen, which is one of the best preserved uh, specimens from Jurassic when we don't think about the Salmon deposits. As you know, Salmon is like a cradle of amazing fossils, especially of pterosaurs, with those soft tissue preservation that are preserved in three dimensions. But outside of Salmon and some other formations in Germany, we don't really get that well-preserved pterosaurs at all, especially when coming to them preserved in three dimensions and articulated. And those things are what Opterosaur is. It's preserved in 3D, at least partially, uh, and uh, all of its bones are still intact and as they would be in real life which is hyper, hyper rare for pterosaurs because they're flying animals, they have very thin bone walls, which means they get crushed and collapse and very rarely preserve well. Uh, and if they preserve well, it's usually in areas of exceptional uh, preservation and barely anything around uh, outside of it. So it's an anomaly, it's a lightning and bottle kind of fossil, uh, and it also represents one of the largest pterosaurs. It's actually, when you look at special material, there's a lot of evidence of pterosaurs being much, much larger than our guy, uh, but when coming to well-preserved complete specimens, all, all one is on a bigger spectrum, because in Jurassic, most pterosaurs are within one meter uh, wingspan. We are pretty confident our guy was definitely bigger than that. So, 
uh, your PhD centers on the evolution of Jurassic pterosaurs. Uh, may we expect to see more of such spectac spectacular discoveries emerge from your research? I'm working on some more remains, but I will not disclose anything. It's very, <laughs> it's very mysterious. So, uh, what in what interesting facts on pterosaurs in general, or Jurassic pterosaurs in particular, do you think our audience may not yet be familiar with? Yes. For some reason, people do really dislike Jurassic pterosaurs. Everybody likes pterosaurs, and as dark kids, as dark kids, like the yeah, next big thing. Each time you mention them, people get fascinated, and they are described from scraps. They don't have the best fossil record, but Jurassic pterosaurs are one of the best preserved. We have hundreds or dozens of specimens with soft tissue preservation, if different osteo uh, ontogenetic stages. They, they are treasure trove of discoveries, especially species like Rhamphorhynchus, and. A, a species representation like this doesn't really exist frequently in vertebrate fossil record. So it's super fascinating that's happening in Jurassic. And then we can do statistical studies on fossils and entire species. That's super rare in paleontology as it goes. So are there are there any are there any common misconceptions about pterosaurs? Uh, I mean, apart from if they are dinosaurs or not, which I think is yeah. just semantics. They share the same tree. It's like how far how far down the tree can it go and say that's a bird or that's a lizard, you know, and that's a crocodile or something because it, it gets complicated. It's just arbitrary. Let's talk around uh, like rapids, uh, which are small lizards that we know from Triassic that might be their shared common ancestor. Uh, but otherwise from that, there's a lot of gaps within uh, the Triassic and how they took to flight, what kind of gradual evolution they had. Uh, unlike birds, which we have quite a lot of transitional fossils showcasing this evolution and allowing us to see why they might have reached the flight. That's not the case in pterosaurs, which are fully flying animals and barely anything before that showcasing why they went to the fly uh, to flying and how the evolution started in the first place. Uh, so that's a big gap and many people think we have an answer, but everything's quite, ex uh, we are just stretching some information we have from like Arbatidids, which are just bits of femurs and bits of skulls of small lizards and fully fledged flying pterosaurs in Triassic and no way of bridging that gap yet. So finding something interesting will be amazing to actually fill it up. And also the, the showcase, that's also the same case for bats. We have no idea very clearly how bats evolved their ability to fly, which makes birds very special because they're the only volant vertebrates in which we have almost entire sequence from them being ground up to them being fully fledged flyers. Uh, and even that one remains controversial. It, it is, and there's some people that might jump into phylogenies and try to explain it in a very, very different way. Uh, and, you know, there's no true answers in paleontology or sciences. There's a lot of speculation, and we can support it with more fossil evidence analysis, analysis but there's never an answer, because something like answer doesn't exist. It's never going to happen that we can close all the gaps, no. <laughs> no. So, uh, the current consensus is that uh, dinosaurs, so birds we just discussed, uh, also took to, to the skies towards the end of the Jurassic. Do you think that this had an effect on the course of pterosaur evolution, and, and what effect do you think this had? I mean, there, we know pterosaurs and birds live in the same form, uh, locations because we find them both in the same formations. We have pterosaurs well-preserved, we usually have birds well-preserved in the same location. So we know they share the same niches from Jurassic. Cretaceous. Think with Jurassic deposits of uh, flying animals, we don't have that many bird or even deposits from Jurassic, apart from things like Sulfacan, and that's not even fully fledged birds yet, or, uh, uh, anything like that. So we know pterosaurs were in uh, flight much, much more earlier than birds were, at least as far as we are aware. Uh, and possibly because of that, they lived in a very, very different, very, very different niche. So Ramparicos and Archaeopteryx might have lived in the same environment. But they barely interacted. One was a flying animal that lived over the lagoons and fed on squids and fishes. Other one is more tertially inclined, not super amazing at flying yet, uh, at least we can speculate, a uh, more tertially inclined animal. So there's not a lot of overlap. They live in the same environment and might occupy the same area, but they're not the same things. They, are both, they, they may have capability of flight, uh, but also that doesn't make, for example, bats and birds compete with each other. Um... Vertebrate paleontology is a very popular but notoriously competitive field of research. Which advice would you have for our listeners that are also interested in pursuing a research career in vertebrate paleontology? 
Okay, I have to say, like, I was very, very lucky that I got into pantology. There's many things that just worked right for me. I was at the right place at the right time, which is usually out of things how they happen in careers. I just happened to pick Sky as a location when I did my fossil hunting, and I didn't know in the future I'll be doing with working on deposits from Sky as well, and that will benefit each other. It's just, I did my field trip there, and five years later, there's a PG opportunity about deposits from that area. That's a pure coincidence that it happened. Uh, and also, I happened to go to universities that were very supportive, that had very good, uh, I had good supervisors, which allowed me to get connected with people that give, left me good referees. So there's uh, the, a lot of things that work in my favor just by happenstance. Right? It's, so it's kind of hard but, to say, follow this thing, follow this one, and everything will ha work out because there's so many things. Well, if I pick up something from here, it's maybe at least already show your interest in fossils, make sure that that's known, but also look for a place that works with them and, and make sure that the people that you work with are supportive. Because, I mean, you can be lucky to come into those positions, but all of them are indeed things that really help you forward. Yeah, most big cities have museums and they have universities and usually museums are open for volunteers so i before even doing pantology i volunteered a lot in a local museum in Bolton. it's not a big thing it's not a big pantological site but it allowed me to get hands and get some experience working in education and museum sector before i even started university and that wasn't even very fossil related but still it was on the line so sometimes you're just looking at local opportunities and trying to tap into them because they exist and just by showing interest you already have things on your CV that make it more competitive. Also, it's quite good to not be all, to not only have tunnel vision, because pantology has a lot of competition. It's not very always open. So I don't look only for options in pantology. I also, like you said, I went to study Mandarin in China, because I was like, that might be useful in the future, and I'm really interested in that topic. And now it's coming useful, because I have to collaborate with Chinese researchers, and that's also coming to my advantage. Uh, I also uh, did a lot of teaching. I taught kids how to do video games. It might not fit into pantology, but when I was doing my uh, PhD applications, they required some education experience. And suddenly, oh, I did some teaching there. I can use it to get the, to this pantology place. I think, yeah, I, I, think, yeah, I think that's really good advice. Also, especially not just to have tunnel vision. It's not like you're not building your career if you're not doing something with fossils every second of every day. No, that's really good advice. Like, there's more to pantology than pantology. It's great to have skills that actually exist outside of the sphere. So how do you spend your the hours during which you're not studying pterosaurs or sleeping? I'm a big architecture nerd. I love looking at architecture. Uh, so I like putting some classical music on and going to a city and just looking at the uh, facades of buildings and trying to figure out from which uh, century they come from, what's the context of them, what kind of architectural styles they, they, they display. And that's something that really, that's only one of the few things that makes me really relaxed. And it's because architecture is like geology, but human, it's like a massive vibration. So you get rocks and you stack them in a different shape. And it displays history of places and time. And you can learn a lot about uh, cultures and uh, history and the relative wealth and travels and connections by just looking at buildings. Where do you see yourself a few years from now, say after your PhD? I have no idea. I'm applying for jobs right now, even though I still have two years of my PhD. Recently, I applied for a job in Warsaw because that's my home country. I have not been it in years. And also, it has amazing things from Mongolia. And Poland suddenly relies on global scale for pantology. So it would be nice to sort of boost it up, have some kind of more internal uh, thing because it's, it, it has amazing potential, both in country and also in the from, uh, in collection it has currently. Sadly, there's quite a bunch of things happening back home, so I have no idea how that will uh, work out in the long run. Otherwise, I would love to go into science communication, because research is great, but research is nothing when you can't communicate it well. And I like communicating it well, even though I'm not the best public speaker, I like illustrating you know, science, I like making it accessible, I like making people talk about sciences and don't feel overwhelmed by it. Like That's why I really wanted to have Plushy as part of my you know, a research campaign, because when you put, give someone a school or board a bone or something scientific, they start panicking because, oh, that's science. I'm not sciencey. But when you have a flushy, that's only a very different experience. People can relate to it. People are not, are not afraid of a toy, but can learn from it. So I'm, I'm trying my best to sort of remove those barriers that people usually have associated with sciences. Because I came 
I or usually previously thought scientists were like this prestigious, rich, very educated people. I'm like, oh no, they're people like me. Anybody can be a scientist. There's no barrier of entry. It's not a hard rocket science. Anybody can understand it. It's just the way how we communicate it. Uh, so I would love to go into media or museum work to, that focuses on making science more accessible, just any science, because we have to make it better and make people understand it easier without being overwhelmed and also know how to criticize information that might be coming in to you know, assess what's true, what's not, how to take advice. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, uh, it was really great uh, to talk to you and, and, and to listen to your wonderful story. And uh, you're a genuine rock star. I would call myself that. Everybody's a rock star. Well, I mean, you work with rocks. You're genuine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're a genuine rock star. <laughs>